name, which is your authority and your character. You're in the midst of us. For we are like-minded with you this morning. Holy Spirit of love, I ask that you minister to your people this morning. I thank you that their hearts are prepared as good ground, that every word that is spoken this day from here forward, Lord, that they will receive with gladness, O God, that they would receive in the Spirit, O God, not according to logic, but according to the mind of Christ. I thank you, Father, for the faith that rises in our lives this day. I thank you, Lord, that the love increases in us this day and that we become obedient to you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Come on, give the Lord a shout. So for the past seven teachings, we've been talking about bring it on home, back to faith again. Right? We've been bringing it on home, back to faith again. Right? And we've been talking on the last few messages about faith working by love. Amen? Have you noticed that faith works by love? Have you also noticed that love works by faith? That some people are very easy to love, and some people require faith to love. If we are going to love God the same way that Jesus loved us, we better be people of faith. Because you once might have been a person that all you could see was your problem. Your situation. Maybe things seemed helpless and hopeless until you got a hold of real hope. Amen. So we sometimes need to understand that we have to live in this place of loving by faith and faithing by love. Amen. This morning, the subtitle of the teaching is very simple. Amen. Revival in your neighborhood. Being revived in your neighborhood is what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to try to make this quick this morning because we have a lot to talk about and I need to save my voice. So in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 39, we hear the story of the Good Samaritan. This is the Passion Translation. You ready? It says, just then a religious scholar stood before Jesus in order to test his doctrines. Have you ever had a, religion, a religious person come to you who was all full of head knowledge with absolutely no spirit to try to test you on what you know about God? Yeah. A person that only knows about God, but you're related to God, wants to tell you about God, but you experience God. Yeah. Right? So they wanted to test Jesus. He posted this question, teacher, what requirement must I fulfill if I want to live forever in heaven? Jesus replied, what does Moses teach us? What do you read in the law? The religious scholar answered, it states that you must love the Lord God with all your heart, all your passion, all your energy, and every thought. And you must love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. Jesus said, that is correct. Now go and do exactly that, and you will live. Wanting to justify himself, he questioned Jesus further, saying, What do you mean by my neighbor? Right? Your translation might say, Who is my neighbor? Turn to your neighbor and say, Who are you? <laughs> Who is my neighbor? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Amen? The Greek word for neighbor is very simple. It's the Greek word plation, and it means close by, or a neighbor, or that is a fellow, as in a man, a countryman, a Christian, or a friend. It also means near or neighbor. So your neighbor is not the person that lives in the apartment right next to you. It is whoever is right next to you, and it is whoever is near you. In other words, your neighbor is who is ever, who is ever, whoever is within your reach. Amen? Whoever is within your reach. Turn to them and say, this is not the time to have short arms. No Tyrannosaurus is Rex is in the kingdom, okay? Thayer says it this way. A neighbor is a friend or any other person, 
And where two are concerned, the other, thy fellow man, thy neighbor, according to the Jews, any member of the Hebrew nation or commonwealth. According to Christ, any other man, irrespective of nation or religion, with whom we live or whom we chance to meet. So your neighbor is more than just your limited thought of neighbor. Amen? So we live in New York, and we have many neighbors. So what we have is when we have many neighbors, we have neighborhood. Right? Or as we say sometimes on the street, the hood. Right? How many of you are from the hood? Right? So who is my neighbor? Who is my hood? Man. Jesus replied, listen and I will tell you. So now we have to listen and God is going to tell us. There once was a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho when bandits robbed him along the way. They beat him severely, stripped him naked, and left him half dead. Soon a Jewish priest walking down the same road came upon the wounded man. Seeing him from a distance, the priest crossed to the other side of the road and walked right past him, not even turning to help him one bit. Later, a religious man, a Levite, and according to the text, a Levite here is a temple assistant, came walking down the same road and likewise crossed to the other side to pass by the wounded man without stopping to help him. You see, he learned it from the, the leader. Finally, another man, a Samaritan, came upon the bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion for him. Ah, he was moved with compassion. The best definition that I could ever give you of compassion was what Bill Clinton used to say all the time. I feel your pain. When you are moved with compassion, you not only identify with the person's pain, you literally feel for them. You feel what they're going through. We are called to be people who are compassionate. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you compassionate or are you stone cold like a rock? Now understand the story because this is very important and this relates to the time we live in. During this time, there was racial tension in those days between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were considered to be a mixed race by the religious Jews. A Samaritan would be the most unlikely person to stop and help a Jewish man. The word Samaritan does not refer to people who lived in a geographical place. But in the Hebrew Aramaic word Saramin, which means keeper of the law. So, this Samaritan stooped down and gave him first aid, pouring olive oil on his wounds, disinfecting them with wine, and bandaging them to stop the bleeding. Lifting him up, he placed him on his own donkey, or put him in his own Cadillac, and not the trunk, and brought him to an inn. Then he took him from his donkey and carried him to the room for the night. The next morning he took his own money from his wallet and gave it to the innkeeper with these words. Take care of him until I come back from my journey. If it costs more than this, too bad. I will repay you when I return. So now tell me, which one of these three men who saw the wounded man proved to be the true neighbor. The religious scholar responded, the one who demonstrated kindness and mercy. Jesus said, you must go now and do the same. Ha. So there's 11 things, there's 11 points that we're going to talk about here in this story. Amen? First of all, we need to understand that we are called Christians. 
right? Christians was not a good term when it originally started. It was almost a derogatory, sarcastic title. Oh, you're like Jesus. You're, you think you're Jesus's. You think you're little Jesus's. It was a put down. Right? Because we're supposed to be Christ-like. Amen? Now, this says here that Jesus is the Good Samaritan. He stoops down and touches us. He stoops down to heal us. He lifts us up. He carries us on our journey. He pays our debt. And he promises to return and reward those that do his will. So Jesus is... He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about himself. He's talking about you who call yourself Christian. Amen? Do you call yourself a Christian? Do you call yourself a believer or a make-believer? Well, the Bible says you know them by the fruit. You don't know them by their knowledge. Even the devil quotes scripture, people. Amen? Amen? Who is my neighbor? In the ancient Near East... There was a division between various groups. Animosity existed between Jews and Samaritans because of historical and religious differences. Jews knew the commands of the Old Testament to love the Lord thy God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they also knew to love their neighbors as themselves based upon Deuteronomy 6, 9 and Leviticus 19, 18. Yet their interpretation of loving their neighbor was limited to only those who were of similar background. In other words, they only spread the love to their own kind. You see, as a church, when a church is only focused on itself and not reaching out to others, that church is nothing more than a spiritual social club. It's only concerned about its own, only concerned about its own kind. Only concerned about, oh, well, you're, 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 you're uh, a Baptist? I don't deal with Baptists. You guys don't speak in tongues. Lose it. Get rid of that mentality. We are all part of the same kingdom. We all play on the same team. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we are one body, but many different members in particular. In other words, not everybody could be a full gospel. Not everybody can speak in tongues because some people just don't understand it. And God is a merciful God and he wants to see everyone to spend eternity with him so he's not just going to limit only to those that believe the best. You understand? So there's different purposes and there's different reasons in the, bo in the body. When the Jewish lawyer asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus used the question to challenge the attitude of the day. The parable of the Good Samaritan defines what it means to love your neighbor. In the story, the man's beaten by robbers, left half dead on the side of the road. While he lies helpless on a treacherous thoroughfare, a priest sees the man and deliberately walks by. Later, a Levite responds the same way when seeing the dying man. Finally, a Samaritan sees the victim and responds. Whereas the two Jewish leaders saw the person in need and deliberately avoided the situation, the Samaritan personified neighborliness. He showed mercy to someone with no regard to background, religion, or potential benefit. You know, you know, sometimes people will help someone because they want something. You know? You know, somebody just hit lotto, and all of a sudden you want to help carry their groceries. <laughs> Amen? I, I want to become your friend. Don't you need another friend? Will you adopt me? Amen? You understand? So the question is, how do I love my neighborhood? Turn to your neighbor and say, how do you love your neighborhood? By looking into the story of this good Samaritan, we can learn how to better love our neighbors by the character's example in the story. Here we go. You ready? Number one, love is proactive. Say proactive. In the parable, when the Samaritan saw the victim, he went to him. The Samaritan was on his way someplace else, but he stopped when he saw the man in need. He diverted from his busy schedule. He diverted from where his destiny... Listen, he was about to take a trip. He was about to board a plane to Hawaii. He needed to get to JFK, but he saw this poor soul with a flat. 
Maui, here I come, baby. Right? You, you get in the picture here? We live in a fast-paced world where it's easy to overlook the needs of others. My goodness, when we live in a city that has about 9 million people, man, it's not very hard to find someone with a need. Amen. We step over them every day. Amen. In this city, we literally step over them every day. How many of you ride the subway? You step over them every day. How many of you go to Penn? How many of you go to Grand Central? My God, turn a blind eye. I, gotta, I just got to get that train and get home. I thought you loved me. I do love you. But if we learn from this parable, we will be careful to be aware of those who are around us. Who is God placing on your heart to show love to? You see, we not only we need to know our surroundings, we need to be very sensitive to the voice and the heart of God being people of mercy and compassion, right? Number two, love is observant. One of the first steps in being a good neighbor and loving others as yourself is to notice others. The Samaritan first saw the hurting man. Right? It says in verse 33, but the Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went and bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine. Right? Granted, a beaten man on the road seems like a scene that's hard not to notice. But Jesus also shows us the importance of seeing people. He sounds very similar to the Samaritan in Matthew 9.36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Amen? Amen? You see, we're supposed to be like Jesus. How did Jesus treat his neighborhood? I should say neighborhoods. How can you... Be prayerful and mindful of people God places in your life. But well, first of all, if you're not praying for them, you're not mindful for them. And if you're not praying for them, you really don't care. Number three, love is compassionate. Right? Verse 33 says, he had compassion on him. He went toward the injured man and responded to his need rather than simply feeling sorry for him. You know, he could have did what the good Christian thing to do was, you know, and just went up to, oh, my God, I'll be praying for you. Yeah. And move on their way. I mean, how many Christians do that? How many Christians have done that to you in need? Yeah. Oh, well, we'll be sure to pray for you. You'll be in our prayers. And then guess what? They go home and what do they do? They don't pray for you. Because you are not important to their self-centered life. We'll have a healing line for the toes. Don't worry. Amen. Do you understand? He went and did something instead of just feeling sorry. How can you be active in showing compassion to someone in need? So number four now, love is responsive. Say responsive. When the Samaritan saw the man, he responded immediately to help meet the man's need. He bound his wounds using the resources that he had on hand. Have you noticed someone in need in your community or neighborhood lately? How can you respond to their need? Number five, love is costly. Of course love is costly because true love is always sacrificial. True love is always denying yourself to benefit somebody else. That's the definition of unconditional godlike love. Amen? It's costly. When the Samaritan tended to the victim's wounds, he gave of his own resources. One of the most valuable resources we have, especially here in the big city, is our tick-tock time, as well as our pocketbook. Loving your neighbor not only cost the Samaritan at least two days' wages, but also his time. God has given us resources so we can be a blessing to others. So let me ask you, what other resources has God given you 
that you can use to bless others. Got it? Number six. Halfway done. More than halfway. Love is inopportune. Turn to never say inopportune. Imagine trying to lift an injured man, who, by the way, is naked, onto a donkey. It just reminds me of last week of those, those faith-filled men who were moved with love and compassion for their friend, that they lifted a paralyzed man up onto the roof of the house. Not only, but they tore the roof off the house. That's not just an expression. It actually happened. They tore the roof off the joint. And then they had to lower him down somehow. Who went and got the ropes? I don't know. Maybe they had long arms. I don't know. Maybe they just dropped him. Hey, listen, he's going to get healed anyway. What's well, a few extra bumps, extra testimony for the Messiah? You know, it reminds me the same. My God, this guy lifted this bleeding mess. A naked, bleeding man. He lifted him up onto his own donkey. Eeyaw. Wow. Lifting the injured man was not a convenient task, and it was likely very messy, given the man's injuries. The Samaritan physically had to support the man's weight by himself, and yet have the donkey not move. Yet he sat the man on his own animal to take him to a place of safety. How have you benefited by someone going out of their way for you? Well, let me give you a good example. Jesus went to the cross for you. Amen. Jesus died for you. Jesus went to hell for you. I don't yeah. think we need a greater example than that. All right? But in the natural, how appreciative are you for people that have actually helped you? Now turn and do it to others. Amen? Number, oh wait. Nope. No, 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 don't, don't rush me. Is there a way you can show love to a neighbor, even if it's inconvenient or not at a good time? Now, number seven. Love is healing. After the Samaritan binds the wounds of the man, he continues to care by taking him to the inn and looking after him. Who here has experienced healing because... You have taken the time to love others. How many of you have experienced healing because you put yourself aside to help someone else? You see, God honors that. You want to be healed? Go heal someone, the Bible says. Right? Pray for one another so you might be healed. Amen? Right? It's a principle of God. Number eight, love is sacrificial. I already touched this. The Samaritan gave two denarii to the innkeeper, which was approximately two days' worth of earnings. Yet the only instruction he gave is to take care of the wounded man. There was no payback expected in return. While it's a beautiful thing when someone we have served gives us a genuine heartfelt thank you, it's not necessary or required. Correct? Our service to others and our commitment to do for others is about what Christ has already done for us and nothing more. Amen. Right? We don't help people because they may give you a reward. We don't love people because they might give you something. As a matter of fact, you need to view helping others as the greatest gift you could ever receive. Helping others is the greatest gift you could ever receive, not what you could gain. You understand? In other words, when you sow, you reap what you've sown. Now, we don't do it with the motive of me first. right? You genuinely love people just for the sake that God genuinely loved us. Amen? So love is sacrificial. What sacrifices can you make 
for someone in need. Number nine, love is communal. Say communal. The care for the injured man did not end when the Samaritan had to leave. Instead of leaving the man alone, he entrusted his care to an innkeeper. When we love a neighbor, the Samaritan shows us that it's good and sometimes necessary to get others involved in the process. Amen? Why not share the blessing? Who can we get involved to show love to somebody else? Number 10, love is promising. When the Samaritan left the inn, he told the innkeeper that he would pay for any other expenses when he returned. Which means when he did actually return, if there was anything else, he paid for it. It wasn't just lip service. Here, I'm going to leave him with you. I'll be back in two days. Pshoom, I'm out of here, Jack. Never see me again. Wasn't like that. It was promising. In other words, this man kept his word. Amen. Amen. Right? The Samaritan owed nothing to the victim, yet he promised to return and cover the cost of any extra care the man needed. So when we love others, the Samaritan shows us to follow through in our care, even if we have no obligation to them. Amen? Amen? I hope you're taking good notes because this is the foundation of our meeting downstairs. Oh, can you please repeat everything you just said? <laughs> Hallelujah. Is there someone you need to follow up with to show them how much you really care? The answer is yes. Number 11. Love is merciful. It says in verse 36 and 37, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The story of this Samaritan is one of a man who showed, showed mercy to another. Okay? So catch this. Mercy is seeing a man without food and giving him food. Mercy is seeing a person begging for love and giving him love. God love, okay? Mercy is seeing someone lonely and giving him company. Mercy is meeting the need, not just feeling it. Right? So compassion gets us to feel the need. Mercy gets us to act upon it. Jesus had compassion and mercy. So mercy is compassion in action. Just like faith is love in action. We catching this? Mercy is the action God took when he felt compassion and love for you. In the famous verse, John 3, 16, we see that God sees us and he loves us and he acted upon that love in mercy by sending us a savior. For God so loved the world he gave. Love always gives. Love always gives. Love always gives. Love always gives. For God so loved the world he gave. For God so loved the world he gave. Not only does he give, but he gives the very best, his own son. Not only does he give the best, he gave himself. God gave God. God. God loved us so much, He gave us God. Yes. Love loved us so much, He gave us love. Because God is love. That whoever believes or has faith in Him would not perish but have eternal life. What need of a neighbor moves you to compassion? What act of mercy could accompany that feeling? Amen? Did you receive this morning? Amen. 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 Now we all could learn from this. And we all need to do likewise. 
We need to go and do the same. We need to go forth and move with compassion and move with mercy. We don't go forth moving with revenge. We don't go forth moving with apathy or empathy. We got to go forth and we got to represent the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit of love. We got to go forth demonstrating the love of God. I love the scripture. When we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us. He didn't just think about it. He didn't just have a fleeting thought. Oh, they could use our love. Oh, did you see the stars today? Oh, look, a pink elephant. No. We were always on his mind. And we still are. Just like the neighborhood needs to always be on your mind. Let me ask you a question. I know some people here have kind of shared this a little bit, so I'm going to ask you. Are you tired of everything that's taken place in your neighborhood? I mean, unless you live in the best neighborhood. Listen, Great Neck has crime too. I'm just saying, it does, you don't have to live in a slum or a ghetto to, to have issues and problems. Are you tired of the things in your neighborhood? Yes. To the point where you've considered getting out? Yes, yes, yes. What if God has you there for a purpose and God has you there for a reason? What if God wants you to bring revival to your neighborhood? Why don't we be spiritually minded about this for a change and stop being so carnal about stuff? Stop looking at the problem and looking at why God put you there to be the problem solver. And we shall continue that downstairs. Amen? Amen. Can you give the Lord a shout? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for watching. We love you and we will see you next week.